going on guys it's brian and jack with superman's comics hope everyone had a great new comic book day because this is the bolo show where we are recapping the hottest releases in the comic books this week we're talking about first appearances reader buzz variant buzz and of course jack has that long-term play how was your new comic book day man you know what it's the busy season so it was filled with a lot of work but this was a great new comic book day. A lot of excellent releases and a good mix of uh, publishers and, like you mentioned, types, first appearances, variants, and uh, several good, I think, long-term plays. But one in particular I'm excited to talk about. Right. It was like 50-50 for me. There were some titles I was really excited about. But then I also went up there, looked at that back wall of all the new releases, kind of just skimmed it for a minute, got what I wanted. But then outside of that, for me, from a reading perspective, I was like, Huh. So I picked up a copy of previews for next month, and I bought the titles I want and walked out the door. But, still a great day. And this show, as always, is brought to you from Nick Dwortman, SlabHeroes.com. If you want guaranteed 9.8s at a great price, or even those Raws, he even has some store exclusives up there. Make sure you check out SlabHeroes.com. Also, if you want to support the channel and get great rewards in return, we have Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Simple Man's Comics. We got tier as low as a dollar all the way up to that $35 tier. And that $35 tier gets you that premium mystery box, that premium bolo box, right, Jack? Absolutely. You know, and we're working with our partners such as Frankie's Comics, uh, Slabbed Heroes, and a few more that we have in the works that we can't talk about yet uh, to get the most premium exclusive variant product for our Simple Men's Comics Patreon family members. And uh, again, hit, hit patreon.com backslash Simple Men's Comics and be sure to check that out. Right. And with that being said, we're going to bring up this week's Bolo list. This comes out again Tuesday night. Now, if you're a Patreon member, you get to see that a little bit earlier. But late Tuesday night, early Wednesday mornings, usually when this hits the interwebs and it gets shared around all across social media. Like we said, covers first appearances, reader buzz variant buzz and that long-term play but we're gonna get right into it right now starting with first appearances this week first one up on first appearance was magnificent miss marvel number 10 this was kind of a hot book today huh without a doubt this was um it sold out very quickly at large retail um we had several people hit us up on twitter on facebook um asking what is the deal with this book um and I don't think people anticipated the popularity. They may have seen somewhere that there was a first appearance in this book, but I don't think they understood the significance of the first appearance. Um, the first appearance is the first appearance of a character named Storm Ranger. But the reason why that is kind of more significant than the average first appearance is this ties into a previously hot Magnificent Miss Marvel issue. If you remember Magnificent Miss Marvel 5, it was red hot out of the gate, hitting $15 or so by the time we were doing this Bolo show that week. Um, and it was for two reasons. One, there, the cover was an homage to Secret Wars number eight. Um, two, it debuted a new costume for Magnificent Miss Marvel. And that costume was made up of like a Cree kind of symbiotic almost uh, material. Well, now that costume has become a sentient being and actually kind of debuts as what appears to be a new a new uh, foe for Miss Marvel. Um, I would also be on the lookout for the next issue, issue number 11, where it looks like they're going to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. all I, Brian, you know where I'm going to go with this. We're already hearing those dreaded comics politics of this being a cameo and... Uh, the 11 will be the first full appearance. You know, we're already hearing that um, because it was a last page, splash page reveal. But I think everybody in the Simple Men's Comics family knows where I stand on that. Um, we had a name. We had dialogue. We have a character in full view. So I don't know what else more you need. Um, but, yeah, this is this is an, kind of an organic, popular, popping book because I don't think there's a ton of readers reading Miss Marvel and then once word got out, um, first place I saw it was when uh, the Key Collector app posted the spoilers. I think that's where a lot of people got that information. Um, I know 
there were a couple websites, comicsheatingup.net, who also um, kind of had the spoiler information up. And once that word got around social media, this book was kind of the talk of the day as far as Marvel titles are concerned. Now, you, the viewer, let us know. Be truthful. Did you pick this up today? Have you been reading Miss Marvel? Or did you pick it up on the first appearance news? And you're just like, ah, first appearance, I'm going to pick it up. Because I'm anxious. I know my wife's been reading this title. She's been enjoying it. I haven't been reading it. I've never been a big fan of Miss Marvel. So this was there on the shelf. And I did not pick it up just because I'm not a big Miss Marvel fan. But either way, let us know. Did you guys pick this up? Also, what do you think of the story so far? Next one on first appearances was Venom 2099. This is that one shot. We talked about this on the last call show as well, right? Right, right. So this is that one shot. We talked about how the story seemed really interesting to us. Um, both of us are kind of, if we're looking by or pass on um, the 2099 program, both of us are kind of on a pass on it. Um, we mentioned in on a video on a previous platform, on a, on a separate platform, I, I talked about where I felt like Marvel had kind of missed the boat on capturing the 2099 audience. I'm going to go ahead and give my little hot take on the popularity of this. I don't think it's I don't think it's warranted. This book has been popular today for first appearance of a new Venom 2099. My reason for saying I don't think it's warranted is what the first Venom 2099 didn't character didn't really hold any sort of major longevity, right? Um, let's be honest, like symbiote stuff is just red hot. Every new symbiote that comes out gets its day in the sun but if you look at the staying power of a lot of these characters you know so you can just think of like the the venom hulk from maybe like a month ago they just don't hang around so um my question would be what is marvel going to do with these 2099 characters long term and i don't think they're going to do much i think this is just part of a program right now to sell some books so if you're reading these books and you're enjoying reading them that's awesome but for all of the people who are, say, trying to put their eggs in this basket, that this is going to be a character to kind of be on the lookout for for the future, um, I don't know. You know, and I know Cover B has the character on the cover, the 125, which is also on the bolo list under the variant buzz section, because it's rare you get a first appearance that shows up on the cover like this. That That is pretty rare. That's usually everything you would ask for in a first appearance. But I think that... This is probably not going to be a character we see a lot done with unless there's some sort of serious fervor for this character. And then maybe Marvel will do one of those great Donny Cates rewrites and somehow bring this character into the kind of current timeline. Then moving into the next book on the first appearance section, we got Buffy the Vampire Slayer number 10. This is what, first appearance of Kendra? Yeah, and if you're not familiar with Kendra, Kendra is um, the Jamaican Slayer from the television show. This is, I believe, the second issue in a row where we're seeing an introduction of a classic um, Buffyverse character kind of brought into this universe. So that, that's good to see. That's I, I like the fact that there's such a tie-in to the show, but yet it's something new. Um, it'll remain to be seen. We talked about this with the last one. I'm going to bring it up again in case you, you missed the last time we talked about this. The big question I have for these Buffy first appearances, because they're not truly first appearances, because most of these characters did appear, is this going to be looked at the same way, say, like the Afterlife or Archie series is looked at? Um, it, it, there's a lot of rumor going around that a Buffy movie or television universe is in the works, that it's coming, it's it's inevitable. We 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 speculated and pondered that this had to happen, right, Brian? We felt like Joss Whedon, he, they're reviving this for a reason. Um, this has got to be coming. And now there's a lot of talk throughout various internet sites that this is, you know, getting closer to being a reality. But the question becomes, if Kendra shows up, say, on a Netflix show and plays a major role, are we going to want her first appearance ever, in the, like in the Dark Horse series? Or because the series will be based on this type of, of universe, will this be deemed the book that people want? Um, I know there's a, a, a large portion of the, you know, the Bolo audience, the Simpleton's content, who just sit there and go, honestly, I don't care about Buffy the Vampire Slayer comics, and I, and I respect that. 
But to those who who truly do, um, that is an interesting question. And also, um, I think before you just easily dismissed, I made the Archie comparison. I think there's a lot of us in the community that would say, I don't really care about Archie comics until they kind of forced you to pay attention to with some of those rising secondary market prices. And I do think that could happen with Buffy. So this is there's an opportunity here where if you see similar success to get in early. Um, but again, we've been talking about this for months. It's it's a risk, but you know, the the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward. A lot of times. I think if the character's pretty much the same as whether it's Boom or Dark Horse, I think the Dark Horse. I mean, you kind of want the first appearance in comics, unless it's. There's a lot of differentiality there between how the character's used. You know, if it's just the same name but kind of like totally different and it's the popular one that if they do a show, movie, whatever, and that person is uh, more to this Boom series, I think there's still going to be some popularity with the Dark Horse just because that's the first appearance in comics. But if they're used completely differently, then sooner or later the popularity is going to wane over to however the character's used. Yeah, yeah. I would tend to agree with you. I think that they have the potential for the Dark Archie kind of thing. But at the same point, I don't think enough people were, are reading these comics, right. whether it's the Boom or the Dark Horse, to differentiate. So if the character pops and, let's say, some popular actor, let's say Rihanna is cast as Kendra, um, and that kind of news would get a lot of attention, right? Well, I don't know that the way that most collectors would find out is probably a Google search first appearance of Kendra. And then they would find out, well, it's, you know, it's a dark horse book from years ago. Yeah. And that's probably how that would work. Um, so, you know, I'm pessimistic as well, but we're still calling these first appearances. This is a reintroduction of a new universe. Um, but we're full disclosure. Says right on the cup, says right on the channel, community integrity. Um, and uh, so that's why we, you know, we want to say, like, we're, we're going to deem these first appearances, but we're skeptical about whether or not long term these will land as first appearances. I'm um, in the next book. We got Annihilation Scourge, Fantastic Four number one. Yeah. Um, so this is the, as I refill my drink, this is the uh, debut of a evil Fantastic Four. I cannot tell you how to pronounce that name that is on the list. Um, yeah, I'm not going to try because if I do, the way I probably pronounce it would be looked upon poorly. It, it, it looks like a made-up word. But um, nonetheless, we're looking at a very evil Fantastic Four. Um, reminiscent to me when I see it of like um, kind of some a helter-skelter style of Fantastic Four. Definitely cool looking. But, uh, again, full disclosure, I, I'm not a big fan of evil versions of existing characters. They tend to only last temporarily. So I don't, I don't look at this like this is a long-term play. Plus, Plus it's uh, Faker or anti-Eternity He-Man. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> different. I mean, that's, that's also different because that is like a separate – a separate character versus you know the temporary heel turn of a popular character yeah which we're going to get into a little bit later yes. again but um yeah let us know uh, did you guys pick this up i'm not a big fantastic four fan either i mean we kind of had that discussion before i enjoy picking up and reading it every now and then but it's not like a must-have for me so let me know if, the, if i know there's some big fantastic four fans out there what do you guys think of this book yeah, and also full disclosure, I'm as far as a reader, like I'm not reading this Annihilation. I mean, maybe people let us know, like if that's something I need to jump on. But you know, there's so much, there's so much out at one time. Um, that's one I've decided to kind of pass on. So that wraps up the first appearance section this week. But we're gonna roll right on into the Reader Buzz section. The first book on the Reader Buzz section is Conan Serpent War number one. Now, before you say anything, huge Conan fan, been loving Conan the Barbarian, been loving Savage Sword of Conan, but picked this up, read it, 
I was kind of more like meh. To me, it was kind of boring. I mean, it sets up a team, um, and it sets up a team that, to me, I'd rather have Savage Avengers. But <laughs> trying to get, acquire this team to battle this serpent. So yeah, so um, I'm with you. The, this book was really a tribute to the character creator of Conan. It features all of his other characters that Marvel has rights to. Um, and then Moon Knight random, seemingly randomly thrown in. Um, I will say I do love that David Finch cover. That's what I'm, we're going to get into. So, as a reading book, I, I agree it fell flat. We're going to talk about the variants, which is what I really want to talk about. And I'm going to say something very bad, and I'm going to say something very good. So bad. I hate that stone blank variant. <laughs> well, we talked about that on. Um, yes. With the Doomsday Clock. So by saying I hate it, I love it. But I hate the uh, high ratio, ridiculous cost of a blank variant. Um, you're forcing, when it's such a high ratio, you're forcing retailers to charge those prices. Um, and for a book that's going to get remarked, the buy in is crazy. That's what we talked about on last call with uh, the Doomsday Clock. It's, it's the reason why that Doomsday Clock yellow blank was so heavily ordered was because it, you could buy it for $3 and change on pre-order um, and get some absolutely dope sketches done. So but, I, don't, I don't know how the Marvel marketing works, but to me, what does it say to your artists that put all this artwork on these great covers and then the one that's your highest ratio variant is one that just has a freaking trade dress, which is the title, and then <laughs> the stone background, and that's your highest ratio when you have some of these other covers. That un that Enhyuk Lee cover, gorgeous. David Finch. Right. I love Giuseppe Camicoli, but I'm not that big of a fan of that connecting variant that they have down there. It's just on the my, bottom left. So my argument would be, two, why are retailers not getting more vocal about this? Because if you look at any of these high ratio blanks, they're not getting the prices for them. Um, they end up being sold at about a half ratio or less. A lot of I see a lot of retailers holding on to them because like they they don't want to sell them cheap. So I still see retailers who who did like store variants for Absolute Carnage number one, still trying to sell that one in two hundred red. Uh, blank for 170, you know, 160, and you're just not going to do it. Yeah, I think the uh, best way for retailers is to maybe if they have, um, can get a deal on, have a relationship with an artist that can do a remark for a decent price, and then you can kind of bundle that price in there somehow, sell well, it yeah. as a graded remark. Absolutely, because they're getting the books for free as a, as an incentive, yeah. but it makes it impossible for a customer to go and buy that book and then. <laughs> If you're going to get a remark on a book you're spending $200 on, I, mean, I don't mean to be I don't mean to be um, morbid here, but you better pull Frazetta up from the grave to do a Conan, you know, <laughs> yeah. remark on that book because I don't know how you're going to make an ROI. And I'm I'm not even talking from like a speculation perspective, it's just that, you know, if you're going to spend that kind of money on original art, most of us tend, like I can go get an artist from down the road that nobody's ever heard of who can do an amazing sketch. But if I'm going to spend a fortune on the book, you know, I want to have some value built into it. And I can't, I just can't see these high ratio books. I just don't understand what Marvel's logic with them is. So I love the creation of these books. I, and, I, and I'm extra bitter because I think that stone one is awesome. Yeah. Um, I think if you took like a brown marker, and you kind of had that outside sketch. I mean, you kind of made it really look like it was chiseled into stone. Um, you could get some amazing remarks, but really stupid. But now let's talk about what they did right. One of the most, honestly, no-brainer, successful high-ratio variants I've seen released maybe in 2019, Brian. And it was kind of under the radar, is this Finch variant. And when I say no-brainer... All you got to do is look at your history. Well, I'm not even going to talk about Conan. Forget Conan. Yeah, if you got Finch and Moon Knight together. <laughs> if you got Finch and Moon Knight together, it's straight money, right? Um, Brian, you know what this is selling for? How much? It was selling consistently for 200 earlier in the day. The last sale was 300 And uh, current asking prices are 300 to 350 
Could we see a dip? Remember, we're, guys, we're recording this Wednesday night. Sure. But I don't know, man. This one might be – this might be another Finch Moon Knight classic. Yep. Because I, how many stores do you think – let's be honest. We gave you kind of the review of Serpent War. This is kind of a weird release, right? It's I was not, say, could you imagine if the book was actually like – phenomenal <laughs> yeah and i didn't see stores doing serpent war exclusives yeah so how many stores do you think ordered if the store ordered a lot they might have ordered 100 to try to get that finch um but i don't see too many stores sitting with like you know if you if they would have done a store exclusive in 3000 per run you'd have been you know could have been sitting there with 30 of those finches could you imagine uh you could literally sell the finches make profit and give the store exclusive away you know you give every customer a a, a store exclusive because you made your money on the finches but um i think the fact that that didn't happen this one has some serious potential so if you are at your lcs and you happen to see this book for a hundred to me this is a no-brainer buy you should absolutely grab it um I love David Finch, too. I think David Finch... You know what the thing about David Finch is, though? We say he's a classic Moon Knight. I don't love everything he does. But if he does X-Men, if he does Batman, and if he does Moon Knight, every time it just rocks. I can see that. I'll say I don't love everything he does, but I love just just about everything. <laughs> There's not yeah. much that I don't like of his. And he's another one that we talk about that style. When you see the cover art, you know that's David Finch work. Without a doubt. But next book we want to talk about from Reader Buzz is Over the Ropes. This is from Mad Cave Studios. Jack and I are big wrestling fans. We've talked about this comic book before as well. There was some buzz going around on Twitter for this. I don't know if it's just within our circles of people that we follow in our audience. Um, but I didn't see this at my LCS. Of course third eye comics i got the smaller one down near me i don't know how many shops actually order this but if you get a chance to pick it up and you're a wrestling fan you definitely want to give this a read yeah so this was frustrating for me too another book i couldn't get locally either um this is why we talk about it. it's funny we've been asked why do we promote because that's the term that gets used mad cave studios um brian and i believe in our what we say on the channel buy what you like um, that's not just our suggestion to you. That's what we do. And we're unapologetic about it. And we like the products that Mad Cave Studio puts out. The quality is there. The people are good people. Um, Jay Sandlin, who did this book, is, is a good dude. Um, and aside from that, if you put out a wrestling title, you're going to get my attention. And then the premise of this book, um, set in kind of the southern territories, well, I'm southerner um in the 90s my favorite era of wrestling um you're gonna get my attention um you know we're talking crooked promoters we're talking uh going against the finish um my favorite moment in pro wrestling uh, i've seen so many documentaries and, and uh you know is the montreal screw job where you know <laughs> you got you got crooked promoters and you've got going against the finish and you've got You've got everything. You've got a wrestler who punched his boss in the face, and they all got caught in a documentary. I, you know, um, incredible. Um, so, I'm all in on the book. The disappointment is, I have this book ordered from a very large retailer that everybody orders from, Midtown Comics. But I'm not going to get it, obviously, for a week plus. Um, so I haven't read it. Um, I did not get a chance to read a preview. I didn't get a PDF or anything like that in advance, like we do with some books. Um, and yeah, I was disappointed when I went to two LCSs local, and neither of them, neither of them had it. And it's just it's typical because it's funny. You'd think all the times I go in there asking for Mad Cave titles, um, and but again, I can't complain. Because that's why we do the last call show, right? Like, you know, you got – one of the major reasons why we decided we wanted to do that show is we wanted to highlight books like this 
and make sure that our audience was aware that the best way to lock these books down is pre-order these books, talk to your LCS, let them know what you want. So you're not going in there on release day thinking, well, I'm going in right when they open, they'll have it. And then finding out, no, I didn't even order that book. What what book are you talking about? And I get that. That's what I get down here. So, um, but this is a cult popular book. Um, they did it, it did the most sales of any Mad Cave Studios book to date. Right. I did get a chance to read it, and I will say it, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but especially being a wrestling fan, you definitely want to pick this up and read it. And I also want to take this time also. Because talking about Mad Cave, I want to switch gears over here. We talk a lot about independent comics on here. Another one that we're favorites of is, is Vault Comics. Damien Wassel, one of the founding members of Vault today, he tweeted out that right now through January 1st, you can basically pay what you want to read their titles online. And whatever you pay, they are also donating portions of that to charity i'll put the tweet up here on the screen let you guys read it but that's something to check out vault comics bunch of great titles I'm not gonna go through all of them right now we've talked about them on this channel at <laughs> i'd almost say at nauseum but for good reason because great guys adrian damien bunch of other great people over there at vault comics so check that out especially if you want to get caught up on any of those series you can read them digitally and pay what you want for them so check that out but, sticking kind of on that indie small press, this next one we've talked about, Kill Whitey Donovan number one. Yeah, um, you know, shout out to Sydney Duncan, who, you know, she, I, I think it's her debut in comics. Um, she's definitely, uh, she's a novelist by trade. We're seeing this novelist transition into comics more and more. Um, we talked about this one on the uh, last call show. Brian, you were hype about this one. Um, and it was funny because... I honestly, full disclosure, I don't tend to be a big Dark Horse fan. Um, I don't read a lot of Dark Horse. Um, I don't collect a lot of Dark Horse. Um, in my time kind of reselling and speculating, I, I would never buy a lot of Dark Horse. Um, but Brian was hooked on this premise, and he sold me before we recorded the show on the premise, and we talked about it, and sure enough... Brian made the comment like he was almost apprehensive to say it because I feel like we I get hammered for saying it about everything. Um, you know, oh, this could be a movie. Um, so Brian was almost apprehensive to say it, but he mentioned that, you know, he felt that's the feel you get when you read the solicit. Sure enough, we find out uh, what well, yesterday that, yes, this this has been optioned for a movie ahead of the release. And today it was kind of like the book to get twenty five dollars for sets of A and B. Um, I think cover A is the cover to me that I think long term is the one to grab. Um, but big, big time hit. Um, I expect uh, Dark Horse to rush back to press. Um, shout out to Larry Doherty from Larry's Comics who mentioned that Dark Horse tends to reprint cover A for um, late printings. I would urge and beg Dark Horse create a unique new cover for this do not bastardize cover a um this is an opportunity you've got the attention of the comic collecting audience take advantage of it and then that's what um other publishers have been able to do over the last year yeah as excited as i am about this book i have not had a chance to read it yet i did pick it up it is in my pile but it's been a crazy day i've read a couple books but this is one i haven't been able to get to yet but I definitely have read it probably before the time this show even airs. Next one we're going to talk about is, this is Spawn 303. It's funny, um, this was not on the rough draft of the Bolo list, the one that went up Tuesday night. This was forced to be on the list through numerous, numerous posts that went out Tuesday night. Um, now, I've been reading Spawn um, since the lead up to 300. And I understand why people are excited for this. There is some cool things happening in the, the Spawn books. Um, the She-Spawn creation of the new She-Spawn in uh, 300 into 301 has led into, and then this is the, the comeback of medieval Spawn, uh, 
has led to Spawn amassing this, like, army. You're basically getting a Spawn team. And uh, people seem to be liking this storyline. It's always hard for me to judge Spawn, Brian, because it's one of those series I'm real nostalgic about. As a kid, like, um, my dad took me to see the Spawn movie when I was, like, way too young to see that type of a movie. Um, but I watched the cartoon with my father, where if you've ever seen that HBO cartoon, a 10-year-old should not be watching that cartoon. Um, I had the toys, the action figures as a kid. So I'm a huge Spawn fan. Um, always have been. So it's always hard for me to judge Spawn when it gets popular with other people because I've always liked it. Um, but it seems to be growing growing in popularity on a, on a month-to-month readership level. On top of that, I think Todd McFarlane doing the CGC signing and, uh, you know, that's kind of reinvigorated sales of a lot of his modern books because I think a lot of people are looking to get books signed and graded. But um, also, it's interesting. I had noticed that Spawn number nine was selling very briskly on the back issue market. And uh, I almost included Angela in the three up, three down that debuted last night. But I didn't because I realized at the last second that the reason that book is selling is because it's the first appearance of Medieval Spawn as well. So it isn't anything to do with Angela. It's actually Medieval Spawn that's got people excited. Problem with that book is there's so many millions of copies. It kind of doesn't matter how many sell. They're not going to sell for more than 10 bucks. But yeah, so Spawn 303 is hot, and it's hot from a true organic reader buzz level. Yes, and then the next one on the reader buzz section, X-Men number three. Last time we talked about X-Men number two on here, I told you (laughs) I bowed out on this. Um, So I didn't even pick this one up. There's no reader buzz on, on my account for it. But I understand there's still a lot of people out there that are liking this run. I do like x Force. But I'm not really picking up X Men now. Yeah, and Jonathan Hickman has been doing the um, the marketing rounds on Twitter, right? First, he said he was trying to get fired. Um, then he's almost been like antagonizing the readership of this book. Um, again, he's not actually trying to get fired. He's not really trying to f- piss off the people who read X Men. He's trying to build almost like a character. It's, it's almost like a wrestling character, right? He's trying to build this promo of I'm the bad boy who changes X-Men lore. But I think he's forcing it more now than he was um, when this all kind of organically happened with the House of X, Powers of Ten. Having said that, I didn't read this book, so I'm, I'm not judging this book in and of itself. I'll say that Alex Ross cover that you see on the far right is dope as hell. Um, but let us know what you think. I kind of already know where people are going to land. I feel like, Brian, people are drinking the X kool aid right now. Every time you and I are even slightly cl- critical of X-Books, we tend to get negative comments. I, I sort of hinted that I didn't love House of X, Powers of Ten as much as other people. And, uh, people didn't react well to it. So... Um, but that's what's great. That's what makes the hobby what it is. That's why people yeah. like. And I get that because if I walk into any LCS in the United States and I say the same opinion, I'm going to get my head chewed off the same way. I just feel like sometimes, and I'm again, we have the best community in all of YouTube. I'm convinced of that. Uh, I'll brag. We don't have the biggest. We have the most organic. But um, I, I'll say um, – we have the best community. There's no bought followers here. We're the, everybody that's um, a part of the Sippleman's Comics uh, YouTube community. Um, you guys are awesome. And even when you don't agree with us, you guys are awesome. The thing about this is, though, in the spirit of debate, and again, this is coming from a lifelong X-Men fan, I don't feel this like earth-shattering shift in X-Stories that I think everybody else seems to feel. And sometimes I feel like uh, it's me. Do you think you know, it might be because you're holding on too tight to your nostalgic X-Men driven stories? Like Claremont fans like the Claremont run. Jim Lee likes the Jim Lee, you know, and then I gotta be, I gotta be honest with you. Yes, probably. Um, 
there's a couple things. Number one, I like the simplicity of the early 90s X-Men run where it was like X-Men, X-Force, X-Factor. But that was it. Hickman is very cerebral, I will say that. Right, there wasn't 10 different runs. I like Donnie Cates' writing. Um, you know, the writer I'm really digging right now is that I wish would write more big two stuff is Matt Kent. Um, I like kind of a simple linear story. Um, Jonathan Hickman, I've never been a huge fan of. Like, I like him. Uh, and he's actually he's from my area, so, you know, I got to support him. But he... Uh, it, it it's complicated. It's a complicated relationship when you read a Jonathan Hickman book. Um, but really, the biggest thing is, and again, this, that's my opinion. I I like that '90s X Men. I kind of just want them in blue and yellow, kicking ass against a different villain every every month. That's kind of how I feel. I like the X Force. Marauders to me is okay. Not really. Marauders is growing on me. Yeah, not really the best on um, Excalibur or. But either way, buy what you like. That's what we always say. Speaking of which, next book we're going to talk about, Batman number 84. I'm starting to feel like Ralphie with his decoder ring because I love this run, but you keep (laughs) dragging it on for me. This is another issue that was basically, this time instead of being narrated by Alfred, it's narrated by... um, the dad, Thomas. Thomas Wayne. Golly. Well, the thing, brain fart. The, thi- the thing is, you only have one more issue. Yeah. So, you know, Tom King's off after 85, so. Well, and it comes up saying the end. And it wasn't a bad issue. It's just like, you end with that last one. You're like, oh, man, Bruce and Thomas going to duke it out. And then it's mm-hmm. like, there was parts that I liked about it because it's like, it's going, it's basically flashbacks throughout the whole, ep- throughout the whole, I say episode, issue. But then you can tell. Like, the panels get smaller. So I saw it as, you know, it starts off the scene, like, the flashbacks are slower. And then once you kind of get to the conclusion of the issue, it's, like, earlier, 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 earlier. And then just kind of the flashbacks keep getting... And then it comes to next issue, the end, or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. I was like, kind of like the issue, but come on, man. But to me, see, I get what you're saying, Um I liked this issue, but I didn't expect a ton from this issue because I knew that I think the next issue is going to be the one where he wraps it up. And again, you also have to remember, Brian, it's not really wrapping it up. He planned the story through 100. Right. Um, this is a forced tie it up and move on. Um, and I'm a big James Tinian fan, so I think Batman's going to be in good hands, but I may. And I'm gonna get killed two books in a row because because I don't love Jonathan Hickman's X Men and I love Tom King's Batman. I don't really care. Um, yes, I, I love that B cover on this. That yes, Matina that, variant. That Matina variant. Right. You know the funniest thing, Brett? Matina's done better work since he got in trouble. I swear. Somebody say he's a bit underrated. He went from being almost like overexposed in the market to now being like an underrated cover artist. But um. But yeah, to me, I like Tom King for the same reason people don't like Tom King. I like his emotion, the emotional storytelling that he does, the the more how it affects the people involved. Um, I've read like a Heroes in Crisis, which Heroes in Crisis is like one of my favorite. We're gonna we're and we gonna, always go back to Grayson. Yeah, and we're gonna do we're gonna do content around our top ten favorite stories from. Um, 2019 and Heroes in Crisis is one of my favorite. Um, but I've read a review, I've read multiple reviews of Heroes in Crisis that are negative. That every reason that I love that series is what the person pointed out as a negative. So I think that it kind of, Tom King is kind of like a, either that's what you're looking for or it's not. Um, there have definitely been some slower issues, there's no doubt. We were on issue 85, man. 85. I bet if you were to sit there and especially go when they issue, come out every two weeks, right? That's that's tough. I do. It's like murder. She wrote out there, <laughs> right? And you talk about the character that gets the most attention of any DC Comics character. That is not an easy task. 
that's not an easy task for any writer. Um, James Tinian has his work cut out for him. Yeah, you definitely know whoever's writing this character has a lot more constraints around what they would have if they had a different character from DC just because there's so much lore and, and yeah. story that's wrapped up into this character. But I've enjoyed Tom King's run. We've talked about it before. There's, there's parts that I didn't like. But as a whole, as a group of work, I actually enjoyed the whole Tom King's run on Batman. But I also think if you don't like Tom King or if you don't like Jonathan Hickman, I see you need them in comics, though, because you want the different voice, the different stories, the different writing methods, because different strokes for different folks. And I, I don't think he did anything differently here than he did on Mr. Miracle or Vision. I just think nobody expected anything from Mr. Miracle or Vision. That wraps up the Reader Buzz section. So we're going to go right now into that variant buzz. I heard a little Jericho in your voice there. <laughs> a little bit of the bubbly. <laughs> <laughs> we're starting with Ninja Turtle Shredder in Hell number five. This is actually the one in ten variant. Yes, this is the slowest moving series. Uh, <laughs> I gotta be honest, when I saw that on the bowl list, I was like, man, that's I thought that was done. <laughs> I'm not sure about why. I, I now first off, here's what you have to understand about the series. It's written and drawn by the same guy. Um so that's a lot of work. And he does the variant covers. So it's like a ton of work for one person to do. But I'm gonna I'm gonna ponder something to use a synonym um i think shredder's coming back in issue 100 yeah we've had people mention that in the comments and as well and i think that you got to remember shredder and hell is not an elseworld story right it's literally just giving you shredder's experience while he's dead i think this story was paced this way on purpose so that it ends right before he comes back. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I know a lot of you probably have not been reading this series. It's phenomenal. The and, and when I say phenomenal, I mean like it's dark Ninja Turtles in a way Ninja Turtles is not dark. Um, the writing is excellent. The art is incredible. Some of these variant covers are out of this world. Yeah, I remember um, when we talked about when issue one and I think two came out and how those yes. one and ten incentives were, were taking off. And and then issue three and four were lower printed, didn't take off initially, but have started to dry up completely the way that a lot of Turtles books do. And I think are on their way to being this. I think it, one through five of the incentives are going to be serious heaters. One may be the worst one because so many stores did exclusives and ended up dumping the incentives onto the market, even though that it's a Francisco Francavilla variant is gorgeous. Um, I think this series was a home run. If you didn't read this one, I encourage you to grab this and trade. Uh, when this these trades are released, grab this one because I think you'll really enjoy it. If, it's, if you like the Ninja Turtles, but maybe you feel like it's campy for you or something, um, I mean, this is literally what the title says. This is Shredder dead and in hell. And him having to kind of go through the, the stages of hell, I believe, before his return. So we'll see. Yeah, but you know what Ninja Turtle book I did like? Wait, we'll get What's to that, that in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Next one up, we're going to talk about Undiscovered Country number one. This is the second print for that. Yeah, and that picture on your screen doesn't do this book justice because it's a gorgeous wraparound cover. Um, shout out to Image Comics. We talk about this. Image doesn't have the greatest reputation with late printings. They tend to punt a lot of their late printings and do the same cover art. But this is a phenomenal um, second printing. and I They've started mixing it up a little bit like the Marked and um, yeah. a couple others, but... They have. They've upped it. That's, it. They they deserve credit where credit's due because they've definitely upped it um, in recent releases for sure. Um, I, but this is a phenomenal cover. It, the wraparound's gorgeous. And I knew that this was going to get overlooked because of the same reason that we hear people complain about the Boom Studios 
late printings, right? We hear people complain, well, why is there a late printing? There's first prints in stock at my LCS. Um, and again, that's not how late printings work. Um, your LCS isn't the barometer for whether a late printing gets uh, you know, put together. If the distributor, Diamond Comics, is sold out of a book, yet is getting a request to purchase a book, a later printing is going to be produced. So yes, there are stores that knew this was coming. It's a no-brainer, right? Uh, Kamakoli, Soul, Snyder. I say you can't beat a more talented creative team. And and they promoted this book for months prior to its release. Um, th so this was heavily promoted. All-star creative team. Rumors of optioning like months before it got released. This was a no-brainer that this was going to get heavily ordered, right? And we saw two and a half million store variants. So, yeah. And um, we knew that, I mean, we even talked about it before. Is we knew the book would most likely be good because of the creative team behind it. But we also knew that there's going to be a bunch of copies out there because it was well-known. The boy that was option news before the book was released you had mm -hmm. the whole summer convention i think you had a couple variants for those conventions as well right sdcc new york right so we wanted to caution our audience not to go out and pre-order heavily cover a and cover b thinking that they were going to make profit because of like the paint by numbers speculations system of oh it's got option therefore i'm going to make money but if you're part of the bolo text community you know that I've also put some text out about this book, right? Um, Midtown had signed copies for three ninety nine. I absolutely advocated buying those. Um, TFAW had the jock variant for a buck. I absolutely advocated buying that. And the funny thing is, when I put that text out, Brian, all I could think about was our last call conversation. Because we said... It's not that we're saying don't buy this book. It's that you wait for that opportunity when you can buy it cheap because it will exist. And it did exist. And the Midtown deal is great. They may still have those copies. They were limiting them one per customer. So they may still have some copies of the signed books. But they had the, the, the first print cover A and the jock variant double signed by Charles Soul and uh, Scott Snyder for $3.99. You can't beat that. Um, Midtown Certificate of Authenticities are as good as a CGC label for authentication. So, um, again, this is a book I like. It's just, you know, it's one of those things you got to be careful with. And this second print, I knew that some, because some stores still had heavy stock on cover A and cover B, I knew that this book would get under-ordered. It seems that it did. It's it's not an above cover price book yet, but I do think over time this book is going to dry up and be a ten fifteen dollar book in due time. Then the next book we're going to talk about in the variant buzz was Marauders number three. This is the one in twenty five variant, but also we have next to it our channel sponsors exclusive Virgin variant, right? Absolutely, yeah. The, and we mentioned earlier Marauders is a series that's growing on me. And it really seems to be exceptionally popular. It was one I kind of ignored when it came out. But you guys out in the Simpleman's Comics family let me know this was something that I needed to be uh, reading. And it, it hasn't really disappointed me. It caught, it caught me off guard that I like it as much as I do. Didn't necessarily love issue number one. Issue number two really kind of uh, built on it. And uh, this variant, though, this and the... This, Second print of, I think it was number one. Oh, like where you the, got, the Knuckles? Yeah. Are, yeah that negative space type variant? Yeah, th these are a hit right here. So this one in 25. And it's in it's Hyak been, Lee. Um, It's been exceptionally popular. Um, I, I think it's uh, G Hyung Lee. Oh, gotcha. Um, but, you know, the, the one in 25... It, it's been selling over ratio. It was up to about thirty-five dollars. It has dipped down to around twenty-five on eBay. Um, but the uh, 
the Virgin is available, I believe, for twenty dollars. Twenty dollars has Frank- been marked down on Frankie's dot Frankie's Comics dot com. Right. But if you're a Simpleman's Comics Patreon family member, of course, you get that 10% discount code. Um, and Frankie's also has the 1 in 25 variant available as well. So you could get both of these covers from Frankie'sComics.com and save 10% if you're a Patreon member. Right. Then the next one we want to talk about on the variant buzz was we talked about Peach Momoko on 3 Up, 3 Down. Here it is. Spider-Man Venom, Double Trouble, that Peach Momoko variant. Yeah, and shout out to Peach Momoko who uh, retweeted the Bolo list uh, this afternoon. So uh, that's always kind of cool and, and nice to see. But yeah, this uh, this one was hot right out the gate. You know, it's, it, it hasn't gotten the heat that the IDW series got, but it's reminiscent of it where it's an under-the-radar Venom series because it's not... You know, with all that's going on with Donnie Cates' run, and that's gotten, say, all of the attention. While yet, this is kind of a perfect storm because Peach Momoku is hot. But I also think it's because it, it's a lesser ordered Venom run. This book is $80 for the most recent sale. Um, consistent sales of 40 the most recent at 80 We'll have to see if that's an outlier. Um, but. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, Venom fans are rabid. They are completionists by the majority. And um, this is not going to be an easy book to find. Right. I still say Peach Momoko is not really my cup of tea, but I do appreciate the art. At least, at least I know what it is. I can't stand, like, if you're talking about art... You talk about these paintings that's like just blue, just blue, and people are talking about like how much these these paintings go for, and I'm like, holy cap! At least this one you have some artistic <laughs> to it. I'm just I, I I like Peach Momoku. I didn't love that Fallen Angels one. I was very honest about that. Um, this one to me, there's nothing really special about it. But I again, like the Spider Man in it more than like the Venom in it. Yeah, I, I, I love her Spider-Gwen one. Her Arrow Mary Jane variant is exceptional. Um, the Black Cat st- st- number one store variant she did was exceptional. I really like the Immortal uh, Doctor Strange variant she did. So it, I like more than I don't like. Um, this one, though, the key is the print run compared to a typical Venom incentive. Um, it's interesting, just scrolling through here, People are starting to ask 120 bucks for this. Yeah. How many how many weeks do we have more than one over a hundred dollar incentive? We don't see that too often. So this and the David Finch, um, if you were a smart variant investor, right. you could have made made some coin this week. Yep, and then the next one on the variant buzz is that folklore's number one. This is the third print. Yes, and it, I love this series. I've I've been open and honest about it. I did a review of it with my daughter. Um, this has been exceptionally popular. You can plug and play everything I said about Undiscovered Country here for those who are wondering, again, why is there a third print? Um, there is a deficit of copies for those who are trying to get a hold of them at, at certain shops. Yes, certain shops are prepared, but others aren't. Um, and one thing I love about Boom Studios is the consistency of changing up their covers, no matter how many covers they do. They haven't delivered a mailed-in cover yet. There's no, like, black-and-white sketch for this fifth print because, well, we, we've already done four different covers. The, everything is unique. And I like, too, that when you look at these Folklords covers, you're getting different characters from the story in with each of their covers. So I'm enjoying this series. I can't wait for issue two. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to issue number two. But moving on in this one, we have Dead Eyes number three. And this is... That's a Fino variant, right? Yeah, this one sold out and was getting a lot of buzz. A lot of people were talking about buying. I can't tell whether this is for the Dead Eye series or is it for Safino? Because yeah, Safino has a huge pretty fan base. Yeah, pretty big fan base. So I'm not really sure what was driving the sales of this one. Let us know in the comment section if you were able to grab this one. And that's gonna wrap up the variant buzz. So we're just going to take this time now, go ahead and get into Jack's 
long-term play. <laughs> and we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. My, well, I guess it's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one, right? Yes, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comes first. It's produced by Boom Studios. I would imagine, similar to the Batman series, if this goes to a second volume, which I imagine it will, it will be produced by IDW and they would flip it. So it would be Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And it's important to know that I don't have all the covers on there because they had one of each turtle holding a helmet. And then also the second one from the right, they had that in a black and white. And then, of course, that one on the far right is actually that thank you variant. So I want, I want to hit this on a few different bullet points of why this is the long-term play. Um, I think that some of our typical Simpleman's Comics family audience is probably going to sit there and say, oh, of course this is his pick. He likes Power Rangers. He likes Turtles. And when, that's not wrong. That I do. Um but I actually think that this is a crossover that is very different from other crossovers, including the Batman Ninja Turtles series, which, by the way, already got a movie. Um, and a movie that was incredibly well-received by critics. I've seen it twice, and it's phenomenal. Um, and has a toy line out right now that are some of the hottest toys of the Christmas season. Um, so this concept has been proven popular. A... Industry, comic industry person that I know who will remain nameless. Um, Brian, he was down on this series when uh, we had a discussion about it. And, uh, you know, he, he said crossovers don't work. They're not organic. And um, I guess the main thing I want to talk about is why this one very much is. Um, first off... Many of you may not be aware, I've talked about it on the show before, there is a history with Power Rangers and Ninja Turtles. The Ninja Turtles appeared on the Power Rangers TV show some 20 plus years ago uh, in live action form. So there's already a canon precedent, because remember, these books take place as part of the canon story from the television show. But there, there is already a canon precedent for these two properties crossing over. Um, there is also – the fan bases are very similar, but there is also another similarity between these two. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is owned by Nickelodeon. And while the Power Rangers are owned by Hasbro, the – television and film distribution rights for Power Rangers are owned by Nickelodeon. So while the Power Rangers will most likely be part of the, the movie universe that Hasbro is putting together with AllSpark Productions, um, on television, you can find Power Rangers on Nickelodeon. And I don't know if you guys out there in the Silver's Comics family are aware but Nickelodeon just struck a enormous deal. Netflix. With Netflix, right. You got to battle and, that Disney Plus monster. Exactly. And that was what that move was done to do. It was it was done to battle Disney Plus. Um, immediately, we heard Kevin Eastman come out and say that he believes he's going to get greenlit to do a very adult version of Ninja Turtles. So we can see... You know, think about that 80s comic run with guns and death, and we could very well see that. Um, but the point that I'm making here is we have two properties whose television rights are owned by Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon now has a deal with Netflix. Essentially, this is already optioned. Um, they haven't announced that they're going to do work on this, but the pathway – when you do these crossovers, it's inorganic in a way because now you have two separate companies that have to like come to ta the table and agree on a deal. A lot of the red tape is cut based on kind of the symbiotic nature of these two properties' relationship. So a animated, an animated film or even possibly a live action or a series could be created for Netflix – 
as effortlessly as anything else that gets created. Um, it's built in right there. And you know with the money that Netflix just put down, they're going to want content. And if you go on Netflix and you type in Power Rangers right now, you're going to be stunned at the amount of Power Rangers series that are currently on Netflix. Netflix is already all in on the Power Rangers. Netflix does not share their streaming numbers, but they must be getting exceptional views for Power Rangers to, to have so much Power Ranger content on the channel at once. So from an option standpoint, that's where I stand with that. Um, so you have history. You have the ability for this to be optioned very easily. Now let's talk about the reading buzz of it. This issue was exceptional. It is a bad guy, evil Tommy story, which is at the core of what every kind of like classic popular Power Rangers story is. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, where'd he go? Where's your boyfriend? <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's what Power Rangers kind of do best. Um, I really like Shredder in this first issue. Yeah, he's like uh, Emperor Palpatine all up in there. Yeah, he's very dark, very demanding. Um, Karai is working very hard to kind of earn his favor. Um, but you know what impressed me about this book the most? The artwork, the interior artwork in this book. I will put up against any book on the market right now. And I had the name, and I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but shout out to the colorist. The color work yes. in this first issue is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so as a, just a comic book, forget about the option, and forget about the fact that these, these two um, properties have crossed over before in this history, and that history is beloved by Power Ranger fans at the very least. Um, the comic itself is a great first issue, on pace to be a great series. Yeah, Mikey gets his butt kicked, doesn't he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and the, it, the, in the in the in the in the it's visually stunning. Yeah, it it really is. Um, when you crack the the issue, you're like, wow. Um, and it's great because you get enough lore from both franchises in the one yes. book, but it's not enough to where they like interfere with each other. I, and I think it it's, may slightly lean Power Rangers, um, but I think that's a good thing because I think the comic book audience is built in. I think Turtles fans will pick this up because they're rabid about everything Turtles, and they may get an introduction to the Power Rangers in a way they may not you know, have typically known. And then we talk about the variants. Just like I said, the artwork, I'll put up against it. I will put up the production of their variants, every one, to any book that's been released in 2019 easily. There's not a bad or misplaced cover. You have the Goni Montez foil variants, which they're already awesome in the Power Ranger series. But the concept behind having each turtle hold the Red Ranger helmet, and then we've already seen solicitations for future issues, it looks like each issue, you're going to have each turtle holding each Power Ranger helmet. And then the thank you variant is like Shredder with White Ranger. Right. So, which to me gives a little spoiler because Tommy's the Green Ranger in the issue. Yeah. Um, so something's going to happen there. Uh, also, Boom has already teased that we're going to see Shredder like we've never seen him before. Yeah. I thought we were going to get a first appearance in the first issue of a different form of Shredder. We didn't get it. So that's something to be on the lookout for in future issues in the series. Yeah, and I'm, if you are wondering, Jenica's not in it. No, Jenica's not in it. I would imagine if they do Volume 2 again and it goes under IDW, that's when IDW would bring Jenica into this. Um but, yeah, the thank you variant is phenomenal. Um, it is probably the book to get. But then we're skipping over the Eastman variant. And the Eastman variant, you talk about 
a no brainer. Um, I, as a diehard Ninja Turtle fan and a person who has like a, I've met Eastman several times, and he's such a likable, passionate guy. I love to see he to me he fits into that realm of like Todd McFarlane and Don't Shoot Me but Rob Liefeld where he's like that 80s 90s classic um, artist who's also a polarizing character but he's also synonymous with something so he's synonymous with Ninja Turtles I love when he steps outside of what he's synonymous with and I think doing this is amazing getting to see him do art for the Power Rangers which is another property I enjoy, is very cool. The 1 in 50 variant is a black and white kind of sketch cover of that FOC variant that you see there. Um, I think that's going to be successful long term. It, it'll be, in the short term, it may be depressed because there are several store variants. But long term, I think it's going to do very well. And then we talk about the store variants. There are some of the most incredible art I've seen on some of the various store variants. We've our sponsor, Nick from Slab Heroes. He has a store variant, uh, actually two store variants that are absolutely exceptional. Um, we've seen Black Cape Comics, One Stop Comic Shop, um, exceptional store variants. Um, Legends Comics and Games and... Uh, Joel's Art Collectibles have a very cool, very different, um, almost like, it. I don't know who the artist is. It's not Stan Sakai, but it almost has a Stan Sakai kind of feel. It's a ninja type cover, uh, and it's a, a connecting cover set. So there's some amazing cover art out there uh, for store exclusives that I think are going to be fun for completionists to chase. But, you know, when you combine all that, I don't have a bad thing to say about this book. These are two properties that had great 2019s. So ending 2019 and going into 2020 uh, aligned together in this crossover with unlimited possibilities, thank you, to the Netflix deal. Um, with an exceptional art program of variants that I think is going to have people hooked beyond issue one. With a book that has a compelling story that has you ready to read issue two literally the second you finish issue one. With with interior art that is, like I said, as good as anything, anything on the market. And I mean anything. This is a phenomenal delivery on what could have been looked at and has been looked at from the outside as simply a cash grab crossover. Um, it's anything but that. Shout out to the people at Boom Studios. Shout out to the people at IDW. This is an exceptional book. This is the long-term play of the week. And guys, remember, the long-term play of the week doesn't mean you're going to be able to flip it this week. That's not what this is. This is a book that I believe will have value and importance within the collecting community for some time. But it may take some time to get there. Either way, do not sleep on this one. Do not ignore this one. Buy what you like, but this is one I certainly love. Yeah, I thought it was a great first issue. And like I said, if you're a Turtle fan, and a Power Ranger fan, or just one of the other, it's definitely worth picking up because it's a fantastic read, especially for the first issue. But then again, you have that nostalgia factor built in, and it's just a lot for those franchises. So great long-term play. And we want to end with a giveaway tonight. So we talked about the beginning of the show about supporting the channel. Patreon.com forward slash Simple Man's Comics. Anywhere from as little as $1 all the way up to that premium bolo box. So tonight, we are going to give away one of these premium bolo boxes. Not just anyone. Our old friends at comicbookinvest.com. They do one monthly on the site. But this time, they asked us to go ahead and give this one away. So that's we're going to do that right now. And to win... This premium bolo box, all you have to do, not in this live chat, if you're in the live chat right now, but once the premiere is over, in the video itself, comment within the first 24 hours of the video being live. <coughs> comment anything. Keep it civil. <laughs> but first 24 hours, comment on the video, and you'll be entered to win the bolo box. And we'll announce the winner on next week's bolo show. But Jack... 
you have some stuff to show of what is going into some of these bolo boxes, right? Absolutely. Now, not only for this for this contest are we going to throw you a comicbookinvest.com exclusive variant, but our channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, they are loading up these bolo boxes with quality. All these books we talk about on the channel, we've got stuff like the Clayton Crane, G.I. Joe. Uh, you like X books? We got X Force. I got to frame this up there. We got X Force. way. <laughs> <laughs> we got X Men. Put it like in front of your face. <laughs> we got New Mutants. There you go. You didn't Spider Verse books? How about a little J. Scott Campbell, Black Cat, J.J. Abrams, Cadaverous? We're coming with Venom. We got that Mary Jane Virgin, Venom 19 Virgin, that incredible Tyler Kirkham variant. We talked about Matina, Batman Nightfall. That excellent Matina. And we talked about Jenica. We got those turtle books. And that is just a small sample. I mean, I, I'm talking about a small sample of the heat that is available in these bolo boxes. We are delivering value above all else. Shout out to Frankie's Comics for providing us with these amazing books that are providing value to the community, that are helping support the channel. And we are happy to be able to give away a box on the show courtesy of comicbookinvest.com. And I will say this, if you are the winner, be sure to repost your box on Instagram, on Twitter, Facebook, somewhere, tag Brian or myself, and make sure you put the hashtag N-O-V Bolo Box, and you will be entered to win another giveaway for the mega bonus Bolo Box of the month. Right, so again, shout out to Frankie's. Again, the box, just so everyone understands, not going to get every single one of those comics in the box. We want to make sure people understand that. But those are ones that we are putting out in the Bolo boxes. And as we're getting more comics from great channel sponsors like Frankie's and stuff, we are growing the value of those boxes. Prices staying the same, but the books are getting better. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. And with that being said, this is Brian and Jack from Simple Man's Comics. And we'll see you tomorrow night for the last call show.